Um, so I want to share with everybody the process that we uh, went through to come up with a land acknowledgement statement. But first, a little site news, like uh, a few others, we're also at that, that place just one year out from a renewal where it's exciting to you know, be doing stuff. Um, and the main news I suppose we have is that we have a lot of transitions, like it seems a lot of people do in our leadership group, including an upcoming transition in the lead PI from me to Matt Betts. So as we all know, an increasing number of universities and faculty and staff members are introducing events or signing emails with indigenous land acknowledgement statements. Uh, these statements attempt to recognize the indigenous people uh, whose lands were stolen to make way for the institution such as the school. Uh, they often acknowledge the treaty that might have been used to, to steal that land and they might name the current descendants of those displaced peoples. Uh, that is, they're almost entirely and almost always purely descriptive statements that include a, a set of facts of the matter. So this is a standard one, this is Oregon State University. Uh, Oregon State University in Corvallis, Oregon is located within the traditional homelands of the Mary's River or Impinifu Band of Kalapuya. Following the Lamech Valley Treaty of 1855, Kalapuya people were forcibly removed to reservations in Western Oregon. Today, living descendants of these people are part of the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde Community of Oregon and the Confederated Tribes of the Sluts Indians. So that ours looks very, very standard. So we might also know that land acknowledgement statements have already been criticized for some of their limitations. They're sometimes viewed as exercises in performative allyship only. Uh, they're criticized for being insufficient, uh, for not being action oriented, for feeling empty, even alienating at times. And sometimes they almost feel like they're mocking uh, what was once yours is now ours. So in short, descriptive land acknowledgement statements might feel as if they lack sufficient meaning, even if they're motivated by the desire to be meaningful, prescriptive action and justice oriented. Well, it's easy to understand why. If we wish to derive prescriptions from action for action from a land acknowledgement, where we cannot do it with descriptions of a set of facts of the matter alone. We must also include statements of value. So we decided um, to write our land acknowledgement with what's called the practical syllogism in mind in an attempt to try to imbue it. So you might remember from logic college, uh, in college the syllogism, right, is just a type of argument that attempts to deductively draw a single conclusion from a set of two premises. And the practical syllogism is a particular type of syllogism where you arrive at a single prescriptive conclusion from a set of two principles. And the difference here is it's a prescriptive conclusion. So one of the premises is going to be a descriptive claim uh, and one will be a value claim. In general form, the practical syllogism really looks like this, right? That the first premise, the descriptive is, is this is what we know. These are the facts of the matter. And maybe this comes to us from Western science or maybe in some other way. The second premise is going to have to make a statement about value or belief in the worth of something. Uh, and the conclusion is going to be prescriptive. This is what we, we therefore must or we will do. So now we can ask ourselves, once we have a, a statement like this in place, well, what are the actions that would help us align what we know uh, and, and what we value with which, what we would actually do in, in the world? What would be our work? So when we set out to write our land acknowledgement, we intentionally employed the practical syllogism to form our land acknowledgement. So it, it reads like this, uh, indigenous peoples have been in relationship for thousands of years with the forests, streams and meadows we now call the Blue River watershed. In the mid 1800s, these people were forced, forced to cede this land to the US government. We continue to learn about, recognize and value the attributes of the Blue River watershed that reflect this enduring relationship. We strive to be mindful of this relationship and to integrate it in our research, our decision-making and our actions. So next slide, you might notice a couple of things here that I would just point you to. We say indigenous people instead of naming a tribe because when we checked with experts, they told us it wasn't exactly clear which group or groups used and were therefore displaced from the area we now call the Blue River watershed. Uh, we say have been because we have reason to believe that indigenous people or people whose worldviews align still occasionally use the Andrews Forest. And the people who were removed didn't disappear. They're part of the nine tribes of Oregon. 
Uh, we say Blue River watershed instead of using the settler language H.J. Andrews experimental force for a couple of reasons. First, we wanted to center the land instead of humans. Uh, and second, we wanted to avoid confusion about who was the we that was making the land acknowledgement. That is, it's the LTR program making the land acknowledgement and not the US Forest Service who is the, the owner of the forest. Uh, and we include an explicit statement of value. We say we value their interactions with the land. And then we offer an action uh, and our action is trying to find ways to integrate this into our work. So it becomes kind of a lever uh, where we can, we can judge the things that we're proposing. Do they match? Are they inspired by? Are they consistent with, uh, with our land acknowledgement? And we've already been using it and actually quite, quite regularly. And that's all I have. <laughs>